I've been thinking about foundations lately and how beginnings often shape an entire journey. It's so cheesy. I've been thinking about my own foundations, both in historic and modern fashion, and the literal underpinnings. This is good since I'm beginning a new purely historical ensemble from the skin out, and at least two of these items will be important. So get thee to the nearest comfy nook, because today we're diving into 16th century underthings, aka Renaissance boobs. Or should I say Renaissance boobs since things got a little monolithic in the chest region during the Italian Renaissance? This ensemble marks my third costuming foray into the Italian Renaissance, and as such I'm starting to kind of know my way around the period a little bit. At least I know more or less how to research the period, which is its own special snowflake. And yet there is one sartorial question that persists. What did women wear between the linen camicia, which is the shift or chemise or smock or whatever you want to call the linen body layer that women wore closest to the body, and the fancy outer gowns? I've chosen three portraits from between 1505 and 1508 to use as my main inspiration for this ensemble. I am super stoked about this period. Uh, it's relatively simple for the Italian Renaissance, with the main focus being more on the overall silhouette and the textiles that were used rather than ornamentation. What I'm focused on for this garment and this video is specifically the kind of core silhouette or like the bodice slash chest area. We can see the bodice during this period is very smooth, the bosom is rounded, there's very little breast separation, hence Renaissance uniboob, and it has been my experience that it's pretty impossible to get this shape and that level of smoothness without some structure or support underneath. I specifically will need some padding to make this shape happen. We are way too early for corsets. Bone stays weren't really a thing until the 18th century. Structured bodices were 17th century. We're even technically a little bit early for Elizabethan pairs of bodies, which we have evidence of later on in the 16th century. So what did Renaissance ladies use to support the ladies? Well, we do have a few clues. The world is woefully devoid of Italian Renaissance extant garments, but we do have a few from the middle of the 16th century moving forward. They're mostly funerary garments. Just get used to that. Eleonora di Toledo, wife of Cosmo di Medici, yes, those Medicis, was buried in a set of stays beneath her gown. These were not boned or corded or even padded but she did have several pairs in her household inventory, so that to me is a good indication that women could wear some sort of bodice underneath the bodice of their outer gown. In her book Italian Dress in Italy, 1400 to 1500, Jacqueline Harold does note the presence of a garment which confusingly went by a couple of different names and could have been padded or corded or whatever to give some structure. I've experimented with this idea and made a couple of structural underbodices previously, and none of them has given me the perfect Renaissance uniboob, but I've learned something new each time, and this time I'm confident. Third time's the charm, we're gonna do it. In Patterns of Fashion 3, Janet Arnold notes that EDT's underbodice is the same pattern as her outer bodice. So safe to say that I can use the visible outer bodices in the portraits to give me some indication of the pattern for this thing. Better yet, Janet Arnold so generously supplies the pattern for EDT's underbodice in Patterns of Fashion 3, which is great for me because I hate pattern drafting. I do love experimenting with period techniques, and I will be doing a lot of that during this project, but for this part, Nah. Instead, I will use Photoshop to scale up the pattern in Patterns of Fashion 3 for EDT's underbodice to fit my waist measurement. Despite being a few decades older than our bodices, EDT's bodice is actually pretty similar. Uh, it's got a rounded squared neckline, uh, the shoulder straps are very widely set apart, in fact they're basically clinging to the shoulders for dear life. There's just you know a couple of very small differences. Uh, Eleonora di Toledo's waistline comes to a kind of low V. Whereas the waistline in the portraits is much higher and straight. So I would say it's probably, you know, where your rib cage kind of swoops up to meet your sternum. I'd say it's right about there. And that's an easy enough change to make on the pattern. There's been some speculation about whether EDT's bodice originally had sleeves or even an attached skirt. I've actually noted a couple of portraits from around the same period as the portraits that I'm looking at, 
which show women lifting the skirts of an outer gown to reveal a skirt underneath. So I know I want my bodice to have some sort of skirt. I'm thinking of actually having it attached similarly to how a pair of hose would attach to a men's doublet, meaning they would have been tied on with a pair of points. Hopefully that won't be needlessly complicated. I am so excited about this, if only because it gives me the opportunity to use the phrase Italian Renaissance uniboob approximately 10,000 times in a single video. Yes, let's do this. Renaissance tailors drafted their patterns directly onto linen mock-up fabric. Obviously, I didn't draft my pattern, but I still made a linen mock-up. is correct, the pattern is then transferred to rough round paper, aka craft paper, to be used for future bodices. P.S. Using a quill pen is fun, but let's not pretend it isn't ridiculous. Eleanor's extant stays are silk velvet, but many of the petticoats in her inventory are silk satin. I used a cotton satin since I had about eight yards on hand. I laid the linen mock-up pieces onto the satin and basted it around the perimeter about one inch from the edge with red cotton thread. The linen will act as an interlining for the bodice, which is pretty typical in bodice construction throughout the 16th century. I tried out some hand-forged tailor shears I found on Etsy, rather like cutting fabric with lawn shears. Quick note on historical accuracy. I do find joy in learning through attempting to use historical methods and materials, but it's really just for fun. It's pretty satisfying to me to think that if I were plopped onto a Renaissance street, which side note, no thank you, that I wouldn't look like an alien, but I'm too early on in my journey to put too much pressure on myself to be perfect. Some of Eleanor's petticoat bodices are noted to contain a layer of felt, which may have been for warmth, but I used felt to give this bodice some extra rigidity. And hey, I found a great use for the tailor shears. To add even more rigidity, I painted the felt with a mixture of gum arabic and water. Gum arabic has been available in Europe since at least the 12th century and in the Middle East for much longer. So we'll label this method as historically possible. I used a pillow and my dress form to dry the pieces into more or less the correct shape. This method worked out pretty nicely. As noted, I need more padding to achieve the desired uniboo. So I built up layers of cotton batting to go along the inside of the chest. I basted and pad stitched all the layers of batting together using coarse linen thread, creating a sort of topographical effect. I then basted this to the felt layer and the felt to the inside of the bodice. I was very careful to baste well inside the seam allowance since the next step you don't want all the extra bulk in the seams.
I made up the lining separately by whip stitching the side and shoulder seams with a waxed silk thread from the wrong side as I did with the self layer. Eleanor's extant stays are lined in linen, so I used this pink cotton linen, which I think I have used to line almost every Renaissance bodice I've ever made. It's from Renaissance Fabrics and it works really, really well for this. I laid the lining into the self, right sides facing outward, tacked everything in place, lazily tucked the seam allowances inward rather than properly pressing and basting them down, and whip stitched first around the armholes and then around the perimeter of the bodice with waxed silk thread. The smaller you're able to make these whip stitches, the better. Mine started out pretty small, and by the end, I had some pretty gnarly gaps. Oh wow, well, it's an underlayer. <laughs> I attached a 3 8 inch woven linen tape to the inside center front edge of the bodice, that was really difficult to say, <laughs> which will help anchor the hook and eye closures. I finished the bottom edge of the bodice with a 1 inch tape cut from self fabric on the straight grain. This edge will eventually have eyelets sewn onto it so that it can be tied to the skirt, otherwise I would have finished it like all the other edges of the bodice. Eleanor's stays have 18 sets of hooks and eyes. Mine have 11. Nothing fancy here, I just marked out where each hook and eye should go and tried to be neat about sewing them on. So the time has come to make some decisions about this skirt. And I cannot stress this enough. Plan out the entire garment and make all of the small, kind of annoying little design decisions before cutting your fabric. I guess I kind of took the skirt of this thing for granted, thinking, you know, it's just a rectangle, I'm gonna pleat it in at the waist, and then it needs to have a little bit of a hem on it. But I actually want to include a tuck on this hem, uh, which is a period detail that I'll go into in just a moment, but it requires a little bit of extra fabric. I think I have exactly enough length to go from the waistline of the gown to the floor with like, maybe like a half inch hem or something. I think I can make this work. I think that I have an idea for how I can kind of fake it with this tuck. Had I planned this out a little bit more, I, I could have actually cut the bodice more efficiently, I think. We're gonna deal with it. First, I wanted to kind of go over what the tuck actually is because I think that this is really cool. This is just a really great resource all around. This is Moda Offerens 1540 to 1580. It is written in both Italian and English. Yay! Pretty specifically about the wardrobe of Eleonora di Toledo, but this book also contains quite a bit of other period resources as well to kind of help flesh out what an entire woman's wardrobe or what an entire upper class woman's wardrobe would have looked like during this time. You can see here all of my notes that I've made. And they have in here, a specific section on different kinds of garments. So specifically here is the section on stays, stomach band, and trousers, which is really cool. Like look, look at her like awesome, very stiff bodice. That's a really cool thing to look at, especially when you're making like a structural under bodice say. And here it's, a, it's kind of funny, like people get this weird impression that women wore like iron girdles during this time because Eleonora di Toledo did have a couple of these iron stays essentially, but they were for a very specific medical condition that she had. So uh, not something that was in every woman's wardrobe. So look, there's our stays. Nobody is making one of these gorgeously detailed portraits of a woman's hem, unfortunately. So we're kind of relegated to these uh, paintings which show you know, the whole body in a little bit less detail. Oh, I guess he has a halo. I thought he just had really frizzy hair. I was like, wow, that's a really cool do, babe. This is actually the painting that I'm looking at for my underskirt. And this has a very special feature, which is this tuck right here. 
kind of a decorative feature, but it is very, very practical for a couple of different reasons. First and foremost, it adds an extra bit of structure to the bottom of your hem, which helps to keep the hem from getting tangled between your legs when you walk. Second is this actually adds an extra bit of length to the skirt that's just kind of like smushed up and kind of like tucked away for later. This one has an edging on it that you can make out a little bit more clearly than some of the other portraits. So you can see it's just kind of like a double line of gold embellishment there. And it's very thin. So I'm using this as one of my primary visual references for this skirt that I'm making to go with the structured bodice. So I definitely want to have a tuck in mind. I will reluctantly do the actual math and some planning and figure out how much of a hem I can afford on my fabric. However, I know I will not be able to get this deep hem and the tuck in my skirt. So I think I will have to fake it. The skirt is the entire width of the fabric, including selvages, and the entire length I had left over. I seamed the selvage edges together using a running back stitch to make a very large tube. Using the selvages as a seam allowance to avoid finishing the inside of the seam is something I secretly did in almost every garment I made in design school despite instructors telling me not to, and something that was common practice historically. I then cut a nice 8 inch deep slash down the center front that will align with the opening of the bodice and allow me to get in and out of the skirt. This was finished by folding the raw edge to the inside twice and fell stitching. Next I pleated the waist edge into a knife pleat. I then sewed this to a strip of self fabric nearly identically to how I sewed on the bottom edge of the bodice. were finished, I added corresponding eyelets to both that will be used to attach the skirt to the bodice via lacing points. Eyelets are simple. The stiletto is pushed through the fabric, and then you just whip around the edges of the hole to hold it open. I'm just using four plies of silk sewing thread for these. Unlike modern eyelets, which are cut holes, historical eyelets get stronger with wear as the uncut threads are more and more tightly compacted. I determined I needed six attachments in all, one on either side of center front, each side seam, and on either side of center back. Each attachment is made up of two eyelets on each edge. Actually stopping to do some very basic math and planning, I discovered I had just enough length for a two inch hem and half inch tuck. Visually, a half inch tuck will look like the epitome of want want, so I am faking it by making my tuck out of a separate piece and using the half inch tuck as a half inch seam allowance. I cut two five inch strips. That's a two inch tuck with half inch seam allowance doubled the entire width of the fabric. I then seamed one side together to make one very long piece. I folded the strip in half lengthwise to make the tuck and basted. I marked a line six and a half inches from the bottom edge of the fabric and pressed a crease into the fabric from the wrong side. I then aligned the tuck along the crease on the right side, making sure the seam of the tuck hit at the side seam of the skirt and basted it into place. I 
I folded the crease from the wrong side, making a tuck taco, and backstitched through all layers half inch from the fold. Ironically, this makes a real tuck along the inside of the skirt and leaves my faux tuck on the outside. The hem is a simple turned hem two inches deep, fell stitched into place. There are other more involved ways to make these kinds of hems, not to mention this hem could have easily been four inches and looked more period appropriate. Whatever, I'm taking notes for the outer gowns hem. I kept the embroidery design at the hem fairly simple. It's just two rows of gold braid along the bottom hem, and another two just below the bottom of the tuck. I used one thin and one slightly thicker braid just for a little variation. I couched these in place with silk thread. During the Renaissance, these braids would have been made using gold wrapped silk, and we can totally pretend mine is too, rather than completely modern Lorex soutache. I made finger loop braids out of cotton embroidery floss. I have one finger loop braid on my channel already, and I have plans to make a video for this specific braid, so I won't go into too much detail about it. Fun fact though, as a modern fashion designer, my specialty is knitwear, so I have a special appreciation for any kind of manipulated string. I capped the braids off with gold aglets, or points, from Burnley and Trowbridge. I think these points may be a little more English than Italian, but I'll take them. Is this what an Italian Renaissance woman would have worn beneath her outer gown to give her torso the desired shape and structure? No, probably not. Does it work for that purpose? So far, yes. Although we'll have to see what it looks like with the outer gown. This is also not the correct kombucha for this gown. Spoiler alert, that will be my next video in this series. In the grand tradition of my underbodices, there are many things I learned and would therefore change on my next version. Most notably, the hem tuck situation. But all in all, a good make. As always, thank you so much for joining me. If you have your own theories on Renaissance shapewear, I'd love to hear them. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe to join me as I complete the full ensemble. Until next time!